Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody's doing well. I'm sure that everybody here has signed in and I'm sure you've all turned off your cell phones. I'm very confident of that. And hello to everybody on Zoom. Uh, this will be the last class for this uh, course, of course. And one thing I wanted to tell the Zoom people, uh, you probably don't realize I cannot see questions that you put in the chat feature. So if you would hold your questions to the end of the class, and then turn off your uh, mute, turn your mute off. I will try to answer your questions as best I can. So uh, that's probably, I should have said that a long time ago. But anyway, uh, the atomic bomb and the end of World War II is today's class, of course. And we're going to finally talk about the use of the bomb and Japan's decision to end the war. Well, of course, this will be Japan's decision to end the war because the Allies, particularly Britain and the United States, have made their uh, requirements clear. They've said that there must be unconditional surrender. Well, why must there be unconditional surrender? And that's simply because they believe that the armies of Japan and Germany must understand that they have been completely defeated. That will end that whole idea of being stabbed in the back, for example, we talk about in Germany. And of course, Japan has never been defeated in its 2,000 plus year history. They've never had a successful invasion of Japan. So they feel, the allies, that they must require that these people understand that they've been completely defeated. But perhaps way more important in my world is they're going to impose democratic governments on this. And the idea of Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt are simply that by imposing democratic governments, democratic governments are much less likely to wage aggressive war in the future. So that is their main goal here, that they're trying to avoid that situation. Well, when we look at the dropping of the bomb and the use of the bomb, and particularly in the United States, the, the standard narrative has been that by dropping the bomb, we ended the war very quickly, and that saved us hundreds of thousands of casualties. Now, I agree completely that that ended the war quickly, but I do not really believe that it end, uh, saved us hundreds of thousands of casualties for the reason I've explained previously is that I do not believe that we would have ever invaded the Japanese home islands. The reason simply being is, is that we could see through our ability to read Japanese codes that they had built up their military on the island of Kyushu, which they were going to call this Operation Ketsugo. We're going to talk about this a lot today. And Operation Ketsugo was going to either do one of two things. It would either defeat us right at the point of attack or it would make things so incredibly bloody and terrible and so many casualties for the U.S. that the U.S. would back off of unconditional surrender and would make a peace that would be much more palatable to the Japanese at that time. Well, when we really look at what was going on at that time, because of our decoding, we knew the Japanese were doing all this buildup. And because the Japanese were doing all this buildup, we could see that this wasn't working nearly as well as we'd hoped it would. And there's very good documentation that Admiral Nimitz and his boss, Admiral King, were about to withdraw support of the naval side of this invasion, which would have caused a lot of consternation with the United States military, believe me, if the Navy said we're not doing this. But the fact is, if they had done that, then there will not be an invasion because they wanted to continue with what they always wanted, which was the War Plan Orange, which was first developed in 1904, I believe. And that was that they would defeat Japan with a blockade. And of course, there would, of course, be the continuation of the aerial bombardment we talked about last week. So maybe no invasion. Uh, I also think that uh, President Truman would have not wanted to invade Japan either because of the amount of casualties that they had seen at Okinawa. So with all the casualties at Okinawa, the thought that we would in have all those casualties on top of that trying to invade the home islands, I really, really believe that that would never have occurred. Now, I do agree, though, that the dropping of the atomic bomb was 
saved a lot of other lives. And of course, it's ended the war much, much quicker. So that's kind of how we're going to start today. And we're also going to talk about revisionist history post-war. And revisionist history starts very, very quickly. Uh, we begin as early as uh, 1946. There's a lot of people writing and thinking that dropping the bomb was a terrible thing to do, that burning Japanese cities and German cities to the ground was a terrible thing to do. And that becomes pretty prevalent. Uh, you could even, those of you that saw the Oppenheimer movie, you may remember the scene where they believe that Germany's defeated. And so now we don't have to build the bomb anymore because Germany's defeated and there's no reason to use it uh, because Japan is soon going to be defeated as well. So that's even prevalent today in the movie. So when we look at these aspects of this, of the it's backlash, I would say, in regards to the use of these weapons and, of course, the use of terror bombing or area bombing, however you want to view it, depending on your feelings about it. And I'll give you a great example, I think, of that backlash. And this is in the Royal Air Force uh, post-war. Uh, the Bomber Command never receives a campaign medal. Now, all the other units, the Royal Navy gets campaign medals, the Royal, uh, 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 a Royal Air Force Fighter Command gets uh, campaign medals. Uh, you know, they all, the Army gets campaign medals. Bomber Command does not get a campaign medal. And they had taken 57,000 dead launching these attacks against Germany and Europe. And for them, I think it's it's incredibly a shame that they don't get a, a campaign medal. I think they certainly deserved it. But that's how strong the backlash was about the area bombing at that time, particularly Dresden comes to mind in that regard. So big issues there as far as how that is going to look, you know, because post-war, there's a lot of issues about we shouldn't have done these things. Well, what comes out in the 1980s? is we begin to give out transcripts of decoded Japanese messages. And we had kept these as a very, very top secret, of, you know, basically for 40 plus years, because we weren't just reading Japanese mail, we were reading other people's mail as well. So it, it had to be maintained as a secret. And so we start to give out these transcripts now. And not only do we give out transcripts, but we start to give out summaries of these transcripts because there's so many of them. And one of note, particularly to revisionist historians, is there's communications between uh, the foreign minister of Japan, Togo, and his uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union, Mr. Sato. And in these communications, you can see that Togo had requested and said that they were looking for some sort of a peace using the Russians as an intermediary. And revisionist historians see this and say, aha, well, here is proof that the United States knew Japan was going to surrender, and yet we dropped the bomb on them anyway. And that leads to numerous pieces of revisionist history that come out, particularly by the mid-1990s. 1995 was a really big year for this, by the way. And so what were these revisionist histories? Well, one is that we dropped the bomb because of racism. We didn't like the Japanese. We didn't like Asians. And so we dropped the atomic bomb on them. Another key one is the bomb was dropped as a demonstration to the USSR. Japan was going to surrender we didn't need to drop the bomb, but we dropped the bomb on them just to show the Russians that we had this capability. One you can see briefly in the movie Oppenheimer, they make a slight reference to this, is that if we had demonstrated the power of the bomb to Japan without the use of it against the city or military target, they would have surrendered. And perhaps the most prevalent of these ideas is simply that Japan was trying to surrender and would have if we had guaranteed the position of the emperor before the bomb was used. 
Well, today in this lecture, what we are going to do is we are going to address every one of these topics. And uh, I, hopefully at the end of this, we'll have, uh, we'll have achieved consensus. Because that is critical to how the Japanese government works at this time. And the idea is simply this. This is known as the Big Six. Their official title is the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War. What happens with these gentlemen, by the way, five of these people are in the military. One is a civilian. The civilian is Mr. Togo here on the left. He is the foreign minister. And what they will do is they will come to a consensus. Now, the emperor might question things, but once they come to a consensus, what they will then do is they will then send that consensus down to the regular Japanese government. Now, you may remember that I said that Prime Minister Kanoe in 1940 abolished all political parties. He abolished the political parties, but the government still exists. It's not very functional, but it, it does exist. And so what happens is they send their consensus down to the next level, which is the government. The government then will come to a consensus, invariably they agree. And then that's sent to the emperor, and the emperor, confronted with the consensus, he will then agree to it as well. So that's kind of how the government works in 1945. Well, when we look at these people, and I, I would like to mention, first of all, uh, Admiral Suzuki, who is at the top there, he is the prime minister. You may remember Admiral Suzuki from the 226 incident of 1936, because he is a subjected to Gekokujo from rule from below. He was to be assassinated because they, the young officers that had that revolt didn't like his policies. And so they were going to kill him. So they break into his house and they shoot him a couple times. His wife gets involved and says, they're going to finish him off. And his wife gets involved and says, well, look, he's dying. I'll take care of this. So what do they do? The officer in charge of the assassination squad says, okay. Orders his men, of course, to salute Admiral Suzuki while he's bleeding on the floor. And they leave. Well, he, of course, doesn't die. But he's well aware of the what Gekko Kujo is. He still has a bullet in him from Gekko Kujo. So... He he gets that whole idea. I also have listed here ones and fours by each of their names. And what's going to occur on August 9th, 1945, we are going to have the second atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. And also that night before, the Russians have declared war on Japan and are beginning to invade Manchuria or Manchuko. And, of course, the Russians had a non-aggression pact that was still in effect with the Japanese, but they kind of threw that out the window. That doesn't, you know, pacts didn't mean very much to the Russians. And so, realistically, this is going to be their positions when they realize that they need to end the war on that particular day. So, what are the positions? Well, we're going to kind of accept uh, unconditional surrender, but we got one condition, and that one condition is that the emperor will maintain the sovereign ruler of Japan. And that's the ones. There's three of those. Then there's the fours. They have a few more conditions. Well, basically three more. So they want, of course, the first condition. But they also want that Japan will disarm itself. Japan will conduct its own war crime trials. I find that one to be a little interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, of course, will demand that there will be absolutely no occupation of Japan. And then they can declare that they never really lost the war. Well, that are the ones and the fours. Well, there's another key player in this whole thing. Really, there's two key players. And that is Emperor Hirohito and his closest confidant, which is Marquis Koichi Kido, who is Lord keeper of the privy seal and you may remember keto because during the 226 incident he's the one that urged the emperor to come down hard on the rebel on the rebellion that the emperor needed to get personally involved to end this rebellion and which of course here he does 
Hirohito, though, afterwards is never very confident that this was what he should have done. It's really not constitutional, and he doesn't think perhaps that he should have gotten that directly involved. So he's always a little reticent in the future about getting involved if there's a consensus. Well, he's for peace, too. And in June of 1945, Kitos makes some suggestions to the emperor of how that peace might go be brought about. And what he Keto suggests is, well, what we can do is we will promise that we will withdraw all our military forces from all occupied territories, providing that the West will then grant those people independence. So, for example, they would leave French Indochina, Vietnam, once we, the French had agreed that in, Vietnam was an independent country, and then they would pull out. And of course, they could use that as a, a method to say, well, look, we won the war because we freed Asia from Western imperialism. And the emperor thinks that's a pretty darn good, I like that idea. That's a good idea. And he goes, but we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a difficult time selling that to the allies. So we're going to need one big victory before we could even attempt to try that. And what that victory is going to be, because that's all they can really come up with, is going to be Ketsugo, the defense of the island of Kyushu to make this a bloody disaster for the U.S. And then the U.S. would become war-weary, and we would agree to this policy, or some policy. Well, if we think about the government of Japan at this time, realistically, the government of Japan is controlled by eight people, and that's what the government of Japan is, is really about. Well, that brings us to revisionist history in regards to the communications. Now, we've talked about how good our code breaking was, and it was fantastic. And I'm going to bust that into two separate pieces. So magic would be our ability to read diplomatic codes which we had that capability prior to Pearl Harbor. Ultra means we can read their military codes. And we had developed this incredibly by 1945. We literally have thousands of people working on breaking codes and then analyzing this stuff. And as I had mentioned previously, by 1945, we can read one million Japanese army codes a month. And then what we do, of course, is that needs to be summarized because, of course, the people that can actually function with these codes, it can make policy with them, they couldn't read all this. So summaries are created so the president can see that, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, etc. And so these summaries are critical to what's going to be considered by revisionist histories uh, the diplomatic side. So the diplomatic side is what they're looking at here. And we'll, we'll discuss this in depth. So on July 11, this, ad, uh, excuse me, Foreign Minister Togo, who we see in the previous picture, is going to send a message to the ambassador to the Soviet Union, this Mr. Sato, who's in Moscow. And he's going to send him this message. And he says, we are now secretly giving consideration to ending the war. Right from our code breaking. Direct text, basically, translated to English. And he goes, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to meet with the Soviets, particularly uh, Molotov, who is the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, and tell him that we would like them to help us to end the war and in exchange for that, what we'll do is we'll give up the Treaty of Portsmouth, which you may remember from 1905, where they got half of Sackling Island, the Kuril Islands, and of course, they received North Korea, the Japanese. So we'll give this back if the Russians will help us. And then on July 12th, Togo sends another message, because they now know that there's going to be a big meeting of the Allies in the German city of Potsdam. And the Potsdam meeting will include virtually everybody and there's going to be a couple of pieces to this the the big piece really at that time is they're going to be looking at 
how Europe will be controlled post-World War II because Germany has already by that time been defeated. And there's going to be other pieces as well that are going to be critical to this conversation. But he also says this during that, you know, that he wants them to meet before Potsdam, basically to head the Soviets off, I think, uh, so that the Soviets are already starting to buy off on this, this peace proposal. He goes this, though, as long as England and the U.S. insist upon unconditional surrender, there is no alternative but to fight on. Well, so when we look at the summaries, the analysis of what's going on, there are key people that are doing this. It's not like they're minor characters. One of the key people is Joseph Brew. Joseph Grew is the former U.S. ambassador to Japan. He is there at the beginning of the war. He's at Pearl Harbor. He's actually in Japan. And at this point, I believe he's the assistant secretary of state. So he's an expert on Japanese government, on the Japanese people in general. And so he's coming to, he's looking at these messages. And he's thinking, eh, this just doesn't look right. Uh, I, I think that the Japanese are basically just trying to buy off the Russians. Uh, they're basically trying to uh, prolong the war as long as possible, hoping that the United States will become war-weary and will agree to different terms than unconditional surrender. And that's our opinion at this particular moment, that this isn't really very serious. And Sato, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, he's really very realistic about this whole thing. And we'll talk a little bit about why I think that is. And he replies to Togo. And he says, how much do you expect our statements of non-annexation and non-possession of territories we have already lost or are about to lose will have on the Soviet authorities? We certainly will not convince them with pretty little phrases devoid of all connection with reality. If the Japanese empire is really faced with the necessity of terminating the war, we must first make up our own minds to terminate the war. That's a pretty harsh statement. Now, he will go on further in another message, actually, but part of this one, too, is that all they can really expect is virtually the equivalent of unconditional surrender. Well, that equivalent that Sato believes they might be able to achieve would be the guarantee of the position of the emperor as a sovereign ruler, or a one. Now, there's other Japanese diplomats and military people, particularly in Switzerland, that are making sort of peace feelers. And they're contacting, for example, our OSS in Switzerland. And... The Japanese government finds out about this. The Japanese military finds out about this and tells these people absolutely to stop it. Do not do this. There's no way this is acceptable to us. And when I think about what's going on here, now Sato, he's being very realistic. These other people in Switzerland, they're being very realistic. The war is lost. Why could they feel that they could say these things? Well, I think it's because they're not in Japan. They're not subject to Gekko Kujo. There's not going to be a group of young officers that come to assassinate them. So they can be much more realistic, I think, than perhaps even some of the people of the Big Six. Well, now we're getting to the, the meat of the matter, because another problem is, is Sato's getting these messages from Togo, and Sato understands how the Japanese government works. It's got to be a consensus. And he says, I have obtained no, this is on July 15th, I have obtained no clear idea of the recent situation, nor am I clear about the views of the government and the military with regard to terminating the war. So what he's really asking is, is, is the emperor agreed to this? Is the military agreed to this? Or is this just you? I, I can't really do anything with this unless I, I know where this is coming from. Is there a 100% agreement that we are going to try to have this peace? And then on July 17th, Togo is going to respond. And basically, he's going to say, he's going to blow that whole piece off. He's not going to talk about that. And he says, please bear in mind that we are not seeking Russian mediation for anything like an unconditional surrender. 
And then where does that come from? Because he, Togo knows he doesn't have the army behind him on this. The army still believes in Ketsugo. And there's a decoded message from General Anami. Now, Anami's a key player, as we'll get to him later. And Anami says, any terms must be formulated on the basis that Japan was not defeated. So again, they're not even close to anything. And it, it, it gets almost worse in the sense that because the U.S. summary notes that Sato is advocating this unconditional surrender with that one condition, and Togo's response is going to be on July 21st to this whole idea is that with regard to unconditional surrender, we are unable to consent to it under any circumstances. We would also both disadvantage, disadvantageous and impossible from the standpoint of foreign and domestic considerations to make a declaration of specific terms. So they won't even offer terms. Well, of course, the reason they're not going to offer terms is because they can't offer terms, because nobody's agreed to this. And U.S. naval intelligence, now here's where it really diverges, okay? Because if you just look at magic, the diplomatic codes, this looks like the Japanese are really trying to surrender. When you look at the ultra side, the military codes, you can see that Japan is doing everything it possibly can to defend the islands and, and to have Ketsu go. You can see all this buildup. And the Navy looks at this and says, aha, we've got to put these two together, because this is really what's going on. And they say this in their summary, until the Japanese leaders realize that an invasion cannot be repelled, there is little likelihood that they will accept any peace terms satisfactory to the Allies. So what's really going on in Japan, of course, is the military is in charge. It's five to one in the big six that the military is totally committed to Ketsugo, the defense of Kyushu, to give us that bloody nose. They are not involved with trying to really end this war. Well, then that brings us to the question we started with. Is the end of the war at hand before the use of the atomic bomb? And I would say that revisionist histories, historians only looking at these one group of messages that they're wrong, that this is not what's going on. Ultra shows you that the military of Japan is there doing everything they can to continue to fight on. Remember always, the people of Japan are told 100 million will die as one. They're still being told that. And there's never been any peace terms agreed to. We can see that by looking at the magic diplomatic uh, messages. And then, so we have to ask this question. If the U.S. had promised to retain the emperor, the Suzuki cabinet would have promptly surrendered. And I told you a book that I thought was so critical to this class was Downfall by Richard B. Frank. And Frank says this, the answer to this assertion is enshrined in black and white in the July 22nd edition of the Magic Diplomatic Summary. There, Sato advised Togo that the best terms they could have was unconditional surrender, modified only what the imperial institution could be retained. Togo expressly rejected it. Given this, there is no rational prospect that such an offer would have won support for any of the other five members, the military, of the Supreme Council for the direction of the war. There's another key factor here. Why don't we believe this? We need to think about December 7th, 1941. And on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese ambassador to the United States is meeting with Cordell Hall in Washington. And he's giving out a proposal not to declare war, but to say that we need to have a pause in diplomatic relations right now. We know everything he's going to say because we've read all his messages. But he's making this presentation one hour after they bombed Pearl Harbor. He finds out that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor from Cordell Hall. So the, the ambassador from Japan has no idea that the Japanese military has done this. And basically, they made an ass out of it. And he's sitting there going, I, I can't believe this, that they've just totally disregarded this and just done it anyway, without even notification, with no declaration of war. When we look at that fact, 
why would the United States believe anything that a Japanese diplomat has to say? There's absolutely no reason. I mean, we've seen it's not the Japanese government that's in control of anything. It's the Japanese military. So we have direct evidence, <laughs> couldn't be any more direct, that at that time and going into the future, why would we think this? There's, there's no reason for us to believe anything a Japanese diplomat says if we can't confirm it from the Japanese military. And that's critical to this whole piece. Well, I'll give you one more piece from Mr. Uh, Frank on Downfall 239. He says this, in the face of this evidence, it is fantasy, not history, to believe that the end of the war was at hand before the use of the atomic bomb. So revisionist history that we were they were going to surrender, we'll talk more about it, but no. Okay. Well, that brings us to the Potsdam Conference that will take place on July 17th of 1945, which, by the way, is one day after we've tested the implosion device, the uh, Trinity test at Alamogordo, New Mexico. And, of course, Truman knows that this has occurred. And a couple of days into it, he meets with Stalin. And he kind of casually says to Stalin, hey, you know, we got a new bomb. Really powerful. What do you think? Stalin goes, well, that sounds great. Why don't you use that on the Japanese? That would be a good idea. And so they, Truman goes, okay, that's what we're planning on. And so they're going to drop this bomb on the Japanese. That's about the extent of the conversation that goes on. Well, of course, Stalin knows all about the bomb. They've got Klaus Fuchs stealing all the secrets out of uh, you know Los Alamos. So there's no real secret for, of course, Truman has no idea. But I mean, it, the, the whole way it was so treated so casually, I think, is very unusual. But that's really kind of how it went down. You know, hey, we got a bomb. So what? <laughs> so... This idea of this conference is, of course, they're going to, how is Europe going to be managed after the defeat of Germany, which has already occurred? But there's going to be another key piece of what's going to go on in Asia. And what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to the Soviet Union, which, by the way, of course, has that uh, agreement with Japan not to go to war, and say, it would be a really good idea if you kind of helped us out in the war here. Uh, we would appreciate that. And the Russians were like, okay, well, we can do that 90 days after the defeat of Germany. And the question is, well, what are we going to get in return? Well, what they're going to get in return, of course, is going to be the renunciation of the Portsmouth Treaty, which is the same thing the Japanese are offering them. So the Russians are like, well, that's okay. We can, we can do this. Well, realistically, there's no way we could have stopped them doing this anyway. I mean, we don't have an army in, in Manchuria to, to stop the Russians from invading Manchuria. So there's really no way we could have prevented this. Anyway, but the idea of why we wanted them to do this. Well, what if the Japanese, we attack the home islands and those Japanese surrender. But what about the two million plus other Japanese that are all over Asia? What if they don't surrender? What could happen is, is there could be another 20 Okinawas trying to get these Japanese to be defeated. If they will fight to the death, then they're likely to fight to the death. So our goal then is really, if we can get Russia involved, that will take pressure off of us, in particularly Manchuria, where there's a large Japanese army called, of course, the Kwantung Army. So we really are going to do that. And that's why we want Russia involved in this war. Another king is going to be, though, is we're going to make what's known as the Potsdam Declaration. And the Potsdam Declaration is going to be the how we, what unconditional surrender really means. And it's going to be based on what FDR had said previously, that there would be no harm to the common people of the Axis nations. That's the goal. And I'm not going to go through this entirely, but... Uh, so the Potsdam Declaration comes out, and uh, basically they say they're going to disarm the Japanese... And uh, then the soldiers can go home and lead productive lives. Uh, they're not going to enslave the Japanese people. Uh, we're, we're not going to destroy the nation, but we are going to have punishment for the war criminals. Uh, the Japanese government will 
begin to make strides to create, to promote dem democracies, to promote democratic style of government. Uh, and one thing that I always thought was interesting here is in 1945, uh, after uh, we have taken over Japan, and uh, MacArthur is in charge of Japan at this time, we actually reinstate the Communist Party, which, of course, had been suppressed in 1922. So it was illegal to be a communist until we got there, and then it was legal to be a communist again, which, looking at what the McCarthy era will be shortly, it's, it's it seems to me kind of funny. So, But to be a communist now, that's part of being a, a democracy, uh, they will have to give back all the territories they've uh, conquered, of course, and they will be able to trade. They'll have the ability to purchase natural resources rather than control them. And will withdraw once there's going to be a responsible government there. And uh, what the final thing is, is that what will happen is, is you will do these things. But we are demanding unconditional surrender of the Japanese armed forces, not the people. But if you shouldn't do these things, well, we're going to give you prompt and utter destruction, which we promise. And, of course, we will. Well, the Japanese response, quite honestly, is no response. So they don't make a response at all. There was no official response from the Japanese whatsoever about this. But... Prime Minister Suzuki is at a news conference, and we broadcast this, so the Japanese news agencies are well aware that we've had this Potsdam Declaration, and they ask him about it. They go, well, what's the response for this? What do you think about this Potsdam Declaration? And he refers to it as mokusatsu. You can take mokusatsu two ways. Now, let's say we're at a party, and... There's somebody you don't know well or you just met, and they say something just outrageous. I mean, it's like it's like ugh, it's like it's embarrassing. Okay. I mean, it's like so off the wall that you don't want anything to do with it. Well, the natural response of most people would, I'm sure they're not going to be confrontational about it. They're basically going to like probably say nothing and hope that it just kind of goes away. Well, that's one way to assume what mokusatsu is. It can be interpreted another way as being silent contempt. So it's it's such a... I, I'm so angry about this, I won't even respond to it. Well, we're going to in, interpret this... Again, it's not direct from the Japanese government because they make no response as silent contempt. And because of that, we're going to give them prompt and utter destruction. And here's what prompt and utter destruction looks like. The one on the left, the picture, is actually Hiroshima. The one on the right, which actually appears to be more powerful, which it is, is Nagasaki. And we can see that these weapons are, are incredibly powerful, but I'm not so sure that everybody really understood that at this time. But Truman, who is the vice president, is never told about the atomic bomb, which seems incredible to me, but it's a big secret. Truman doesn't need to know about it. Apparently, he's just the vice president. And he becomes president, of course, FDR dies. And a couple of days into his presidency, they say, oh, by the way, we think maybe you should know about this bomb we're building. And he's like, oh, my. Uh, and... They basically urge him to use this bomb, that, that this bomb needs to be used. We've developed this thing, and it's, it's going to be a, a, a great weapon. And Truman thinks this about and says that, well, I, I think we can use this, but only be used to end the war. Well, the, we still talk about this today, even about that first use of the bomb, that perhaps we should not have done this. Uh, and... Really, when I think about some of this, I think that the U.S. government and the U.S. military didn't have that good a handle on what this bomb actually was. They just see it as a more powerful explosive. Uh, I think the scientists understood what it was. I don't think there's any question that. But I think that these government and the military, they're not some more powerful explosive. 
And as far as radiation goes, well, the, the thought is, it, it, there's a variation here. It's like, well, maybe gamma rays that are emitted from this bomb, well, maybe if you're more than 3,500 feet away, feet, you probably won't die. But if you're within 3,500 feet, you'll probably kill you. Well, as of course, we know today that gamma radiation will kill you much further than that. And another thing they believed, actually, was that one hour after the explosion of this bomb, it would be okay to go walk around by where it exploded, because by that time, the radiation would have dissipated. So it basically shows you how little they really understood about what they were dealing with. And that brings us to the idea that, well, maybe, the and the scientists were pushing this, particularly Ernest Lawrence, uh, and... What they wanted to do is they wanted to have a demonstration rather than blow up a city, because if you wanted to use it on a military target, it was so powerful that you couldn't drop it on one factory and then expect it to not destroy a lot of things around the factory as well. And so they thought, well, maybe what we could do is we could have a demonstration and we could show the Japanese that we have this power and that they will then surrender. They couldn't come up with an idea how this would possibly work. So, for example, if we told the Japanese on, you know, a certain day at a certain hour, we were going to have a giant explosion over Tokyo Bay. And what's to keep the Japanese from sending up a bunch of fighter planes to shoot our, our bomber down? Uh, what happens, the fact is this old thing is not really tested. For example, we never even bothered to test the little boy bomb. So what's to say that the little boy bomb will even function? And so then we would look pretty stupid that we had told them there was going to be this big explosion and nothing happened. So if it's a dud. So they debate this for quite some time. It actually goes on for, I believe, a couple months. And they finally come to the idea that there is no good way to prove to the Japanese that this actually is, is real, that they would actually believe it. And even after Hiroshima, people in the Japanese military say that the bomb's not that big a deal because as long as you're underground, you're safe. Okay, so it, it's, it was questionable that this would ever work. Yeah, it would have been certainly nice if this had worked, but it seemed to be unworkable at the time. Well, that brings us to the 509th bomb group. Uh, this is uh, the people that will actually drop the bomb. And you can you can see yes sir. I've uh, I'm good friends with the with the guy that uh, has worked for the same Japanese company for over thirty years. Uh huh. And he's made he's made a hundred flights back and forth to Japan. Uh, his air battles were unbelievable. Anyway, he I I made a statement to him, and I think I've said it before. It seemed like it seemed like. Uh, where we should have probably dropped that bomb was right on the palace because that man was the one killing all his people. But he said, I know that. He, he said, no, no. Maca he, he said McCarthy gets credit. He said, no, no, we can't do that. No, yeah. that, that would not be true. Yeah. MacArthur would not get credit. Uh, but the fact is, is that, and as I will show you very soon in this presentation, that that would have been a really bad idea. A bad idea. So anyway, the idea here is that they're going to have this 509th bomb group. We've got uh, Mr. Tibbetts there. Uh, he was an excellent pilot. He was a pilot that uh, was fought over Europe and particularly North Africa. He was actually uh, he made a private pilot, in effect, for Dwight Eisenhower in Africa. He was then transferred to the B-29 program and he will become the man that's in charge of dropping the atomic bombs. Uh, the aircraft he's flying, Enola Gay, uh, is named after his mother. If you would like to see this aircraft, you can go to the Smithsonian in Washington, and you will be able to see it directly because it still exists. And this whole group was organized into basically two sections. One section was to bomb Germany. One section was to bomb Japan. When the Germans launched their last major offensive in the West, which we know is the Battle of the Bulge, 
FDR actually was concerned that they might actually break through. And he had reached out to uh, Leslie Groves, General Leslie Groves, the general in charge of uh, building the bomb, and said, how soon is that bomb going to be ready? Because we could probably use this in Germany if things go really bad. Well, of course, things don't. So Germany is defeated before we're able to create the bomb. But really, we plan to use that bomb on Germany. There's no question about it. And it's designated as a composite group. Uh, what that means is they're basically self-contained. So they have virtually everything they need, maintenance, et cetera, to operate without other people being involved. Well, they get to the island of Tinian, and they're completely secluded. Nobody knows what these people are doing. They're basically in a barbed wire enclosure. Uh, they uh, don't have communication with other bomb groups. They don't bomb with the other bomb groups. They, the other bomb groups go off and do their job, and nobody can understand what these guys do. Okay, Why aren't they flying with us? So this is a ditty that comes out. I won't go through the whole thing, but it says this. It says, take it from one who knows the score the 509th is winning the war because they don't think that the 509th is really doing anything. And they're going to launch missions. And what they're going to do is they're going to have little three plane formations. And one of those planes is carrying what they call a pumpkin. And that is a fat man shaped bomb that's full of regular explosives. And they fly over a Japanese city and one plane drops one bomb. Well, of course, they're practicing for the atomic attack. But they're also getting the Japanese used to the idea that these little three-plane formations are not a big problem. And so what they'll do is they'll drop this thing in the wind. Okay, so the pumpkin is dropped into the wind. The minute they drop it, they make a radical turn. And what they're going to do is they're going to use that tailwind to help them get further away. And also they're flying those silver plate B-29s, which are lighter, have better engines, so they're faster. So they're much more able to get away from uh, the blast from that explosion. So that's kind of the idea with the silver plate and how this thing is functioning. But they do make about 12 of these missions over Japan. Well, that brings us to the actual uh, date of the explosion on Hiroshima, August 6th of 1945. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the little boy type bomb. It's never been used before. It's never been tested, but they're very confident that this weapon will work. Uh, it contains, I believe, 141 pounds of U-235, which is incredibly difficult to separate. That's basically a year's supply of of U-235. That's how hard it is, as we've talked about, to make this stuff. And very little of it actually fissions, only a couple of pounds. But that little couple of pounds of fission actually is able to create uh, 12 and a half to 15,000 tons of TNT equivalents. It will destroy 4.7 square miles of the city of Hiroshima almost instantaneously between blast and the firestorm that goes on with this. And of course, there'll be a significant amount of radiation as well. And like I said, it's really difficult to get U-235. And the Japanese actually had their own program in 1943, they started it to build an atomic bomb. Of course, they don't have anything like the capability we have to build an atomic bomb. They just can't afford this, but they at least start to investigate the possibility of it. And so they have an idea that U-235 is going to be mighty, mighty difficult to separate. And that's going to put the thought in the Japanese mind that we have very few of these bombs. So let's keep that in mind as well. So when this bomb goes off, it drops, kills 80,000 Japanese almost instantaneously between blast, firestorm, and, of course, radiation. Uh, it's a tremendous human toll. Uh, to use this type of a weapon. We then are going to three days later, because the idea the U.S. has is that we need to convince people that we have a lot of these bombs. And so they're trying to rush an attack on Nagasaki as quickly as they can for good weather. The reason they need good weather is these bombs are only supposed to be dropped visually. They're supposed to be dropped with the Norden bomb site. 
For example, the Hiroshima bomb is actually pretty accurate. It lands within about 200 yards of where its aim point was, which was a T-shaped bridge. So pretty good bombing, because we talked about the Norden bomb site not being necessarily always that great. Uh, well, Nagasaki mission is going to go really bad. And some of the reasons is, I'll try to make this brief, is the plane that's going to be used is called Boxcar. And if you'd like to see box car, that plane is actually at the United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. And box car takes off and they got a fuel pump problem. So there's 600 gallons of fuel that are trapped. They can't use it. They decide to go on with the mission anyway because they think they have enough capability to do it. They are not going to bomb Nagasaki. They're going to bomb the city of Kokura. So they're flying to Kokura, but they first have to pick up another plane off of uh, Iwo Jima. Well, that other plane is there. So they circle around Iwo Jima for about 45 minutes, and now they're running out of gas. And they said, well, we just got to go. So they start heading for Kokura. They get to Kokura. It's cloudy. They circle around Kokura again. It's cloudy. They circle around Kokura the third time. It's still cloudy. And now Japanese fighters are coming up. The decision at that point is made is we've got to hit our secondary target, which is Nagasaki. We will only have enough time for one bomb run over Nagasaki. They get to Nagasaki. It's cloudy, but amazingly, the clouds part. And they drop the bomb on Nagasaki. It's very questionable that the, the clouds actually parted because, quite honestly, they missed their target by about three miles. Uh, but they did manage to drop it into a valley, which will significantly limit Japanese casualties. So be honest, they dropped that thing by radar. They won't admit that, but that's most likely what occurred. And unfortunately, the valley that they dropped that bomb in is where the largest Catholic cathedral in Japan is located, and they completely destroyed that Catholic cathedral not to mention they kill many of Japan's uh, Catholics in that city. So that is a problem with whether they drop that bomb. But that is the brief story of Boxcar. Oh, by the way, they can't go back to Tinian. They don't have enough gas, so they're going to land at Okinawa. When they land at Okinawa, one of the engines actually quits on the runway for lack of fuel. So that's how close that they ran this mission, which was... It was, but again, they were in such a hurry to get this off. They wanted to prove the Japanese that we had a lot of these bombs, even though, of course, we don't. Well, that brings us to the Soviets getting involved in World War II, uh, as far as Japan goes. And on August, the night of August 8th, they're going to launch this major invasion of Manchukuo, or as we know it today, Manchuria, which was a puppet state of Japan. And it's going to be a big attack. Now, the Japanese Kwantung Army that's there defending this area, its best units have all been shipped off to like Formosa, Okinawa, etc. And it's still a very large army, but it's certainly not the quality army it was early in the uh, war. It was Japan's best army in the 1930s. And it's a shell of itself. It's got a lot of troops, but it doesn't have a lot of tanks. It doesn't have a lot of guns. The troops it has are basically conscripts. They're not well trained. And the Soviets, of course, have uh, an army that's just finished fighting the Germans. So they're combat veterans. Uh, they have some of the best tanks in the world. And of course, we've supplied them with thousands of trucks. So they're a very mobile army. Well, they're going to crush the Russian, or the Russians are going to crush the Japanese. It's, there's no question about this. And they do. The Japanese units will generally fight to the death like they did in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, they will cause significant casualties for the Russians, but they can't really stand up to this army. Well, one of the things that came out of Potsdam was, of course, that we wanted the Soviets to get into the war, and we were going to give them things to get into the war, but we were also going to have agreements about where the dividing lines were going to be, where the spheres of influence were. One of those spheres of influence was going to be the 38th parallel in Korea. So North Korea would become part of uh, the Soviet sphere of influence. South Korea would become part of our sphere of influence. 
Now, we have no troops there whatsoever. Still Japanese. But yet the Russians actually do stop at the 38th parallel, which I find kind of interesting. But it's also why we, of course, have North Korea today, which has got a, uh, a communist authoritarian government, which, of course, uh, is supported by the uh, uh, Russian government uh, somewhat. Uh, we see recent agreements between these groups, for example, the North Koreans sending uh, Mr. Putin about one million artillery shells. So there, still to this day, we see problematic with this division at the 38th parallel. But I do find it interesting that they actually did stop. They didn't really need to. Well, what's going to happen next, of course, is there's going to be another aspect of this, and they're going to retake Sakhalin Island. Uh, remember, the Sakhalin Island was divided in half, roughly. I put a little red line there to show you where that would have been. So that southern half is Japanese. There's going to be major fighting there. There are also the Russians are going to retake the Kuril Islands. And also what they want to do now is they want to invade the Japanese home island, the northernmost home island of Hokkaido. And this is going to this invasion is actually going to take place on 822, 1945. Well, by 822-1945, the Japanese have surrendered. They haven't signed the peace treaty, but they've surrendered. So the Russians are going to take Hokkaido anyway. Well, this is a part of the deal. Okay, The deal was is that the home islands would be the U.S. sphere of influence. And Truman gets wind of this, and he's not happy. And he basically tells Stalin, don't do this. This is not the agreement we had. And you better not do this. And the biggest reason is, of course, the U.S. Navy is vastly more powerful than anything the Russians could provide. And we could easily isolate Hokkaido anytime we wish to. And so Stalin actually decides to back off. So what are the results of this? Well, for example, the Russians are going to capture primarily in Manchuria 2,726,000 Japanese citizens. About a third of those are going to be military. Only 2,379,000 will ever return to Japan because what they do is they ship those people off to the gulags in order for them to help rebuild the Soviet Union post-World War II. Many of these, the last of them, I don't believe, came back until the, I'd say, 1955, as my memory serves me. And the first year alone, the first winter, 179,000 of those civilians are going to die. 66,000 approximately of the Japanese soldiers are going to die under Soviet captivity. Now, if they had captured Hokkaido, how many more would they have shipped out, of course, to help rebuild the Soviet Union? You can only imagine this. So huge amounts of casualties because of the Russian intervention. and we'd have to hope that today we didn't have another North Korea and actually Hokkaido. So very, very uh, questionable behavior on Russia uh, at this time. Well, it's August 9th, 1945. And that night, of course, the Russians had invaded. And the emperor calls an imperial conference with the big six because this is a huge problem. While they're actually at this conference, they are informed that now we have dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. So that's a, it's a, a huge shock to the Japanese. First of all, the Russians, they didn't expect them to come into the war until 1946. And of course, they certainly didn't think that we had more atomic bombs, which we do. And so now this has been put in their face and that's a huge problem for them. Well, now they've got to make a decision. They have to make a decision now because they're confronted with the Soviet entrance into the war. And of course, we continue to bombard them with nuclear weapons. And Kido, on behalf of the emperor, says what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to accept the Potsdam Declaration. Of course, we're going to have to have some modifications to that. And we need to uh, find something that the allies will accept. But 
we're still pretty confident that we've got Ketsugo, we've got all these kamikazes, and we're going to get some concessions from the allies because of this. Well, they're going to have this meeting. It's going to go on and on and on and on through the day. And they can't come to a consensus. And then Suzuki reaches out to Kyo and says, well, I think we got a consensus. This is really questionable. Uh, and he says, what we can do is we can probably get everybody together on this. So uh, the big six, they continue to argue about this. And what they're going to have is they're going to have the people with the single condition, of course, uh, which is that they're just going to have the emperor uh, will be maintained as sovereign ruler. Uh, of course, there's going to be people, the fours, where they want the three additional conditions. And the the ones are Togo, Yonai, and Suzuki. So there are two military that have agreed to this. Uh, and the fours are going to be Toyota, Umezu, and particularly Anami. Uh, and they're trying definitely to get some sort of agreement here, but they can't come to an agreement. It, it just isn't working out. And they're going to try to come up with something. And like I said, so what happens is this, this is the uh, Suzuki reaches out to Kido and says, hey, you know, we're going to try to put the fours through. We're going to, we think the four conditions will be agreed to. They send this to the lower part of the government. Remember, the big six is over the regular government. And there's more arguments there. And this keeps going on for hours. And finally, Suzuki says, I can't come to a consensus. We can't do this. We're not getting there. We need to do it, but we're not getting there. And so what he proposes is that the emperor will have an imperial conference that night. And that they will let the emperor decide what the proposal to the allies will be. Well, first of all, that's unprecedented. It's never been done before. It's not constitutional to let the emperor, remember, it's always supposed to be a consensus is presented to the emperor, but now they're going to make the emperor the sole decider of this issue. And Hirohito realizes by this time that the, the war is over, and he's, he's really a one. There's no question of that. And he says at this conference, I swallow my own tears and give my sanction to the proposal to accept the Allied proclamation on the at basis outlined by the foreign minister, the ones. So that's going to be the proposal. And when we look at what that proposal actually is, and I, I'm going to refer to Herbert Bix. Uh, he, he won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for the book Hirohito and the Making of Modern Japan. This isn't without, it's really not that, uh, great of a proposal, what they're actually trying to do, because Bick says this in the final analysis, the Kokutai, remember the national polity, the position of the emperor, meant to them in their moment of extreme crisis the retention of real substantive political power in the hands of the emperor, so that they, that he and the moderates might go on using it to control the people of Japan. So it's it really is basically saying we're going to maintain the government the, the way it is, uh, even though it, we're going to agree to these other things. Well, of course, that's not going to be acceptable to the Allies. And that brings us to Secretary of State James Byrne. And really interesting character. Byrne thinks that he should be president of the United States right now because he should have been the vice president instead of Truman. And so when FDR died, he would have been president of the United States. He is now Secretary of the State under uh, Truman, and he's one of the authors, really, of the Potsdam Declaration. He has made some significant modifications to the Potsdam Declaration before it was presented to the Japanese. Uh, one of the things was that there was going to be, basically, they were going to say that the emperor would not be prosecuted as a war criminal. That was per Joseph Grew. And that's what he wanted. That's, so they took that out of the declaration, okay? And then the reason he does that is because the United States just happens to be a democracy, and the United States people weren't particularly fond of this whole idea. For example, only 3% of the people thought that the emperor should be retained and that wasn't a war criminal. 
17% of the American people thought that the emperor should be immediately executed. And the vast majority thought that he should be at least tried as a war criminal. So Burns really realizes he can't just agree with what the Japanese want. We wouldn't agree to it anyway, but he, he has to come up with some idea because to your point, there's all those Japanese, two million plus in India, uh, you know, uh, in Indonesia and in, in China, et cetera. And how are we going to get those people to surrender? Well, you know, because the last thing we want is 20 Okinawas. We don't want 20 Okinawas. We want them to surrender. And who might be help us do that? The emperor. So Burns is going to send a reply. And it's a very interesting reply. Remember, the Japanese have requested this. They said that they will accept unconditional surrender with the understanding that the said declaration does not compromise any demand which prejudices the prerogatives of His Majesty as a sovereign ruler. They can maintain their government, the Kokutai, etc., as his stance. Well, we're not going to agree to that. Uh, but what we're going to say is this. It's like, well, here's an option. The ultimate form of government of Japan shall, in accordance with the Potsdam Declaration, be established by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. So here you go, Emperor. If you can convince the Japanese people that you should maintain the Kokutai, then guess what? We'll agree to that. And, of course, we're going to do everything else. We're going to have uh, the occupation, etc. But we give them that carrot. That, you know, if the Japanese people agree to this eventually, then you can stay as, as emperor. Well, the ones and the fours are just outraged by this whole thing. Well, and particularly the fours are like, well, see, we told you. There's no way that the Allies were going to do this. That So we need to fight on. We need to keep fighting to the death. A hundred million die as one. And... Another problem for the Japanese is they didn't bother to mention to the Japanese people that this was going on. They sent this in code to the U.S. The U.S. decides, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to drop some leaflets on Japan and tell the Japanese people that, by the way, your government has tried to, you know, has kind of accepted the Potsdam Declaration. The emperor and Kido are losing it at this point. They're like, oh, <laughs> this is not good. And so now they're going to have another conference. And Anami and the fours have an idea. What they're going to do is they're going to bring in some major military leaders. And they're going to bring these people in. And they're going to convince the emperor that the war should continue on. And the one person they're going to bring in particularly is Field Marshal Hata. And Field Marshal Hata is the man that's in charge of defending Kyushu. He's in charge of Ketsugo. Also, his headquarters was at Hiroshima. And so he has had firsthand experience. He's lucky to be alive because a lot of his headquarters was blasted by the explosion. But he survives it. And they bring him in to convince the emperor to keep fighting. And he says this. He goes... He had no confidence in repulsing the enemy, and he did not dispute the emperor's decision to accept the Potsdam Declaration. Ketsugo is dead. The man in charge of Ketsugo says, there is no reason why the U.S. would bother to invade us when they have the atomic bomb. They're not going to do it. This is a joke. And Ketsugo is dead, and Ketsugo is the whole point behind the, the fours, basically, and not agreeing to unconditional surrender. That was their one hope. That causes this. And this is when Hirohito makes the decision that he will accept the Burns note. He urges his people to make sure that they continue to do their best for Japan, that they will follow his directions, and he is very, very, of course, everybody's crying. It's, it's, it's a, a terrible scene, really, that they've now come to the conclusion they have no choice. But the emperor is willing to bet that the Japanese people will sustain him in his position. And he's going to send out an imperial rescript. 
and that imperial script will be done via recordings. So he makes two recordings of this script that will be broadcast to the Japanese people. And what he says there is that, moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable. So he specifically mentions the atomic bomb. And then he specifically mentions is that they're not surrendering just to preserve Japan. They're surrendering to preserve the entire world. Which, of course, is they're trying to, again, give a little bit of uh, save face in regards to the why they are surrendering, of course. But And he also makes an appeal to his imperial ancestors, which is very interesting to me. Um, Throughout this whole end of war piece, he has reached out to Quito several times. How is he going to protect the imperial regalia, which we talked about, the mirror, the jewel, and the sword? Those three holy relics symbolize the divinity of the emperor. How would he protect those in the face of invasion? And he reaches out to Quito numerous times about this. Now, what can we do to preserve this? Because he's very concerned about maintaining the position of his imperial ancestors and, of course, the entire idea of the Kokutai. And he writes a letter to his son post-war, who actually became emperor, uh, Akahito, and he states that if the war had continued, he would not be able to safeguard the three holy regalia. So we have to question this in some regard. I have some questions about this personally, that was he more concerned about the preservation of this idea than he was for the Japanese people? And I think there's a big question mark there. So now the Japanese are going to surrender to a term that the Allies have made. Well, maybe not, because once again, we're going to have Gekko Kujo. Young officers are going to try to stop this. They are going to break into the palace. They are going to try to find those recordings. They firmly believe that their allegiance is not to the emperor. Their allegiance is to the imperial ancestors. So once again, we see that these type of people or these young officers really don't care about the emperor. They care about the idea of the emperor. And they are going to try to do everything they can to stop this. Uh, they kill the uh, general that's in charge of the Imperial Guard. Uh, his name is Mori. You may remember in 226 incident, they killed that Imperial Guard general as well. It's not a very good idea to be an Imperial Guard general with Gekko Kuja going around, apparently. And they break in, but they can't find the recording. And finally, cooler heads become involved. Now, the thinking is, is that General Anami could have put this down right away, but he's really kind of wishy-washy about the whole thing. And he doesn't really put his foot down. He's just, well, maybe this is, you know, you know, but I don't really support this, but, you know, you guys have this idea, et cetera. And I'm, you know, so nobody's really sure how much uh, Anami was involved with this. He could have been involved quite a bit, maybe not. Again, it's it's one of those mysteries. But cooler heads prevail. They basically convince these officers that this isn't going to work, that they need to stop. Many of these young officers will then go in front of the Imperial Palace and commit seppuku, uh, ritual suicide. And then what's going to happen a little later is Anami is going to commit ritual suicide. And... He leaves a cryptic message. He goes, I, with my death, humbly apologize to the emperor for the great crime. Well, what is the great crime? Not sure. It was the great crime that he supported the re uh, rebellion, in effect, or that they started the war and lost the war against the Allies? I, I actually asked uh, Rich Frank, uh, the guy that wrote Downfall, uh, the author, I said, well, what do you think about this? Do you think that this was, uh, Anami was, you know, complicit, or do you think that it was just a general apology for losing the war? And he said, well, no one really knows. 
but his opinion was really it was about the war, not about the insurrection piece. So I would defer to Mr. Frank in that regard. I'm sure he knows way more about this topic than I ever will. But General Anami is now gone. And after the war, we begin to what they refer to themselves as the Peace Party, which I find a bit humorous myself. But they will have this conference with the U.S. about what actually occurred at this time and how they feel that the bomb was so important. So we see this here, that here's uh, Togo and uh, Quito, and Quito says, we of the Peace Party were assisted by the atomic bomb in our endeavor to end the war. This gentleman, who is part of the government, not the big six, uh, he says that that the bomb was a golden opportunity given by heaven for Japan to end the war. So you see that they see that this was so critical to get the military to quit. Now, why is that? And Quito says again, if military leaders could convince themselves that they were defeated by the power of science, not by lack of spiritual power or strategic errors, they could save face to some extent. So they're not defeated by men. They're defeated by really the power of the gods. And they can therefore save face. Well, what happens if the war continues? Remember, the idea was if we didn't use the bomb, we were going to just blockade. And my feelings are that the war would have lasted at least six months longer, minimum. That, but that's, a, I think, a fairly reasonable number. Because by that time, the Japanese would have been at the point of starvation. So when we look at this, what is the cost? Okay, So we see all these losses. So, for example, in late 44, famine breaks out in North Vietnam. Now, the French are somewhat complicit in this, too. But perhaps 500,000 to 2 million Vietnamese starve to death. Why is this? Because the Japanese army has got 2 million people living off the land in these places. And we've seen their behavior, for example, in Manila. When they realized that they were basically doomed in Manila, their behavior became much, much worse. It was never good to begin with, but it became terrible then. So when we look at that, and remember, these people know that they're basically doomed. They're going to be fighting to the death. Uh, their behavior gets worse and worse. They're confiscating food. They're basically doing a lot of terrible things all over Asia. And again, we don't want to have 20 Okinawas fighting these guys. They're causing starvation. Uh, in Indonesia alone, 4 million Indonesians starved to death because of Japanese occupation. Robert Newman does a study post-war, and he comes to the conclusion that for every month the war goes on, there's 250,000 Asians, not Japanese, Asians, that are dying because of Japanese occupation. Take that out six, eight months, you're looking at millions of people starving to death. So we have to ask ourselves, when we use that bomb, are Japanese lives more important than Asian lives? Because that's what's going on here. We need to end the war as quickly as possible. And then that brings us to prisoners of war. There's about 168,500 POWs. About 15,000 of those are in the U.S. Or, excuse me, our U.S. Uh, prisoners. And those prisoners, there's a, a, I don't know if I would call it an order, but there's a, a communication that goes out on August 1st of 1945. And it's called the August 1st Kill All Order. And there's debate on this order as if the person that sent it out actually had the authority to do this. But what they're saying on August 1st of 1945 is that they will not surrender any prisoners. All prisoners will be executed. And, of course, with starvation going on in Japan, the question is, of course, will these people be fed? Of course not. They're not going to feed them. So when we look at this, there's no way these, these POWs were going to survive uh, uh, Japanese cap captivity if the war continued to go on. And then... 
we need to look at starvation in Japan itself. And starvation in Japan was a major, major issue. We've talked a bit about this, but what we were going to do is now we're basically running out of cities to destroy. So we're going to destroy their railroads. Once we destroyed their railroads, they would have no way to transport food because they didn't have a road network. They don't have any fuel for trucks, et cetera. And so what's going to happen, of course, is the Japanese are going to begin to starve to death even more radically than they are. Now, this doesn't occur. And what happens is the Japanese in 41, their average consumption is 2,000 calories per day. By 45, this is down to 1,680. They can't get fertilizer from the mainland, and everybody's digging trenches instead of farming. So they're having a major problem. They're going to have a terrible crop. So by 46, the war is over. They're down to 1,042 calories per person. In Tokyo, they're down to 800 calories per person. And in May of 45, there's actually 150,000 Japanese protest in front of the Imperial Palace. So you can see that the, had we starved them out, had there been a blockade, eventually the Japanese would have overthrown the emperor in the Kokutai, most likely. So MacArthur, to his credit, he says this, you know, we got to feed these people. So he starts scraping up food from all over Asia. And he gets 96,000 tons of food into Japan. And then former President Hoover gets involved. He reaches out to the United States and said, we need to ship 600,000 tons of food to Japan right away. And people are like, no, they're the enemy. We're not sending them any food. And MacArthur reaches out and says, he's prosecuting war criminals for starving prisoners to death. And the United States must do better. And we do. We finally send 800,000 tons of food and prevent total starvation of the Japanese people. So with that, we've come to revisionist history of the A-bomb. The first one, of course, we talked about revisionist history was that we used the bomb due to racism. I would say that's not true because we were going to use the bomb on Germany as well. We also firebombed German cities and we burnt them to the ground. So I'd say that is not true. The bomb was dropped as a demonstration to the USSR. I would say that's probably not true. Yes, we wanted to. And one other thing I need to back up on racism. There certainly was racism during World War II. There's no question about it, but that's not why we dropped the bomb. Was it going to be to ex make a demonstration to the Soviets? I don't believe that because we actually asked the Soviets to get into the war uh, and we couldn't have stopped them anyway. It wouldn't have made any difference. Uh, they could easily march into Manchuria. We had no way to stop them from doing that. And we certainly weren't going to start another war with the Russians while we're still fighting the war with Japan. That's just insane. The U.S. people would never agree to that. If we had demonstrated the power of the bomb Japan against, use it against a city or a military target, they would have surrendered. Uh, I don't believe that either, uh, because they said themselves that what they needed to do was that they would just make stronger fortifications, and we couldn't have that many bombs anyway. So demonstration is out. And that brings us to the last one, which Japan was trying to surrender and would have if we guaranteed the position of the emperor before the bomb was used. And... We know because of the decrypts, et cetera, that they were never going to do that. They hadn't even made peace proposals. Uh, they certainly uh, were not going to realize that they would, were defeated completely until they understood that Ketsugo was dead. And, of course, Ketsugo was not dead until we dropped the atomic bomb. Well, so my thinking is that... Because we used the bomb, it ended the war much, much quicker. And this was a huge benefit. It saved probably millions of Asian lives. Not Japanese lives, but Asian lives in general. And that's a huge, huge benefit. But I think also we need to think about the fact that we imposed unconditional surrender. And unconditional surrender meant that we were going to change the governments of Germany and Japan. We were going to turn those into democratic governments that would be much less likely to go to war in the future. They certainly wouldn't wage an aggressive war. And 
this was the policy of Franklin Roosevelt and, of course, Winston Churchill. And when we look at today, it's 79 years later, there's been no aggressive wars with Germany. There's been no aggressive wars with Japan. These people are basically our allies today. Uh, there's no possibility in my world of a future uh, aggressive war with these countries. So I think that FDR and Churchill would have been very pleased that, that they had done this. And quite honestly, I think that we should be as well. And with that, thank you all for coming. I'd gladly take questions. Quick question regarding the time between the two bomb droppings. Was there expectation that after the first atomic bomb was dropped, that there would be some type of negotiation or surrender? And were there actual conversations engaged in during that two or three day period? Uh, first of all, uh, that was a, certainly a hope, but the Japanese made no appeal to us until after August 9th. I believe they actually make the uh, appeal on the, I think it's the 12th. Uh, don't quote me on that particular date, but they do not make that uh, uh, offer to accept the Potsdam Declaration with the one condition that the emperor maintain, maintains sovereign ruler until after that time frame. So between those two bomb droppings, they weren't even convinced yet for Hiroshima that they should that Ketsugo was over. So uh, the answer to that would really be no. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, how many died at Nagasaki? I believe my best recollection is that the casualties of Nagasaki were 39,000. 20,000 between the two cities. Right, and then, of course, there's going to be radiation damage later on for people. Uh, the reason I ask, Frank, is that I, I read somewhere, and I don't remember the source, but um, the office or the Department of War, it was called at the time, we called the Department of Defense today, but the Department of War had done uh, planning, and they knew that in a an actual invasion of the home islands was going to kill 2 million Japanese civilians. So, yeah, the blockade would starve them to death, but if we invaded conventionally, we were going to kill 2 million Japanese civilians, not to mention all the U.S. and how yeah, about how the U.S. You never mentioned over the U.S. that would have been killed if we invaded. You know, I think they said they estimated 500,000 U.S. casualties if they invaded conventionally. You could go to a million. You know, it could go to me. Excuse me, I didn't quite catch that. No, I, that's what I was saying. Is that you didn't ever mention a number of, of of our people, our soldiers that would have been they would have been would have been died if they we had to invade. Oh, uh, I had talked about that during the Ketsugo lecture. Yeah, yeah. but that's okay. You might have missed that one. Yes. Uh, it it been varied. Uh, the the original estimate for uh, Kyushu by MacArthur was. Uh, 23,000 killed and uh, uh, for the first 30 days, and then a total of 105,000 uh, to get to the stop line, which I think was ridiculously low. Uh, but that's MacArthur. I'm not a big MacArthur guy, as everybody knows. Uh, like I said, uh, I would, if I had a ballpark, which I would, if we were going to do Kyushu and uh, invade uh, Honshu at the Kanto Plain. Uh, if you're talking about just casualties between the Army and the Navy, uh, I'm looking at probably pushing a million. If you're going on and on. Yeah, it would have been close to a million. Yes, sir, Mr. Barber. If, if you accept that uh, we were going to invade the main islands, it's, it's a cumulative considering the Asians in the uh, Indonesians that were starving at this huge rate per month right. that would keep on starving and probably accelerate the longer it took us to defeat the Japanese by invading. I mean, those numbers become exponentially long. Well, of course, because we weren't even going to invade Honshu to the original plan until the spring of 1946. How many millions would have 
stop. Well, you do the math on that. Roughly uh, August to then would be eight months. It'd be two million just starvation. Uh, using his figures, you have another Holocaust. In fact, yeah. In fact, it, 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 the bomb in my world. It, it, and the Japanese said it themselves that it was a golden opportunity. They needed to stop this war. Uh, and and finally they did. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, it seems critical that, uh, to all of this that both bombs worked, even though they were different technologies and all that. And they weren't sure about the second one, but it worked. Uh, this brings me where were we in developing bombs three, four, five, and six? I, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because I had actually written that out of this presentation because I didn't have time. But uh, I'm going to do this really quick. Okay, so the question is, is when did the bomb actually become a weapon instead of a science project? Okay, sure. that's a, is that the way you'd put it? Okay, so all right, I'll give you a great example. Uh, these things... It's 1948, and we're conducting a test called Sandstone. And the Sandstone test is out in the middle of the Pacific. And there's only one group of people at this time that actually know how to assemble an atomic bomb, and they're out in the middle of the Pacific. Now, we've got parts for maybe 10 or 12 bombs, but the people that can actually put these parts together are out doing Sandstone. Well, what happens is is the Berlin blockade by the Soviets. And now we have to have what's known as the Berlin airlift. And Truman goes, you know, it might be a good idea if we had a few bombs handy because this could turn into a war. And basically they have to tell, the Air Force has to tell Truman, well, you know, that's a problem because we don't have anybody here that can put a bomb together. Uh, they're all out in the middle of the Pacific uh, doing this test, sandstone. And, uh, but, you know, we could get one together eventually. Uh, so what happens then is it's called the creation of the Mark IV. The Mark IV uh, fat man type, implosion type bomb. And the Mark IV is going to be the very first atomic bomb that will be mass produced. Uh, we make approximately 550 of these. They're functional until about 1953 when we decide that they're, we, we could use the materials to make other bombs more efficiently than what these things are. And But we do make 550 of Mark IVs, and they are actually a bomb that can be easily assembled uh, and dropped by just Air Force personnel. You don't need a bunch of scientists around in order to make this bomb work. So... Well, we were recycling food. We still do, really. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's the that's the story of the of the first mass produced atomic bomb. So, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Hope you really enjoyed the class.